Thank you very much, Rob, and uh, thanks everyone for coming along tonight. Great to see such a good roll up. I'm going to have a talk to you about a more positive aspect. We look at a lot of negative things and habitat destruction and fish numbers declining and things like that. And fishermen always talk about the good old days. We all hark back to the times we believe anyway through our selective fishermen's and fisher ladies' memories that past was always better than today. But sometimes it pays to actually have a, a little bit closer look at that. And I'm actually going to argue that we're living in the good old days now if we look after it properly and do the right thing and I think that there are some fairly positive signs and messages. I think it was Jonathan that actually posted the question on the Ausfish website a few weeks ago, do you reckon the fishing was better a hundred years ago than it is today and, and it got a lot of response and most people of course said yes the fishing was better a hundred years ago than it is today and it's a hard one because even though Jonathan thinks I was around a hundred years ago I wasn't and none of us were. It's a, an interesting thing to think about if you could jump in a time machine and go back and I reckon most fishermen play this game sometimes in their mind and I know that I would love to get in a time machine with today's gear, my boat and a sounder and a bait caster and a spin rod and a whole bunch of lures and go back 200, 500, 1,000 years. Can you imagine fishing this river when it was often clear enough to see down into the snags and see cod holding on a snag 10 metres down in the water and see schools of silver perch that took two or three days to pass a given point when they were moving upstream to spawn and things like that would have been amazing. But 100 years ago, I'm not so sure about because 100 years ago is the 1920s and we'd already done a lot of damage by a hundred years ago. So I think if I was going to jump in my time machine, I'd go back further than a than hundred years. I'd go back to at least the time that European settlers first moved into these areas to see what the conditions were like in those days. I, I think it would have been pretty amazing. Of course, the indigenous people had been catching fish and supporting a big part of their diet from fish out of rivers like this for thousands of years before that. They never put the fish under any, any great stress because there just weren't enough of them and their techniques for taking them weren't sophisticated enough and they just lived in harmony with it and caught fish. And the early European settlers chronicled the way that they caught fish. And you can see how important the native fish were to indigenous people by just how often they turn up in their art and their mythology and their, their stories. There's even a story in, in Aboriginal mythology that the Murray itself was created by a giant Murray cod that was being chased by a, a warrior with a spear and it was the tail beats of this giant cod that actually made all the bends of the Murray River. So it's a, it's a great story. And they were very, very significant to the indigenous people. And when the, um, when the Europeans arrived, they were fascinated by the whole thing and watching the way the indigenous people caught fish and, and how they utilised them as a food source. And they were really interested in the fish too. They were very different fish to the old world trout and salmon that they were used to from back in Europe. And early naturalists spent a lot of time chronicling the fish. Interestingly, the first Murray cod that was ever scientifically described actually turned out to be a trout cod. Uh, it was caught in the Macquarie River up in central western New South Wales and it threw the scientists into a bit of a quandary for many years because that, that first description of a Murray cod actually turned out to be a trout cod so then they had to play around with all the scientific names and everything but they were just fascinated by the fish and they're such different fish and such different life cycles. Trout and salmon in the in the old world most of them run to the ocean if given a chance and then the adults push back upstream so it's big strong adults that'll jump over stuff to get back up into the rivers to spawn and then the little trout and salmon drop back down the river and grow and then ultimately end up in the estuaries or in the ocean or in a big lake or whatever and then they repeat the cycle. Our fish are very, very different to that. Our fish need that same mobility but it's not big spawn ready adults that are trying to push upstream a lot of times. It's often little juveniles that are trying to move upstream and we put all these barriers in their, in their way. And our fish, Murray Cod and Yellowbelly, don't jump up through rapids, you know. They, they don't do spectacular stuff like that. They're, they like to stay under the surface and they'll push up through slower flows and around the edges when there's a flood or whatever. And we put all these barriers in their way that they can't do. And we've tried to build fishways and some of them work and apparently this one doesn't. Uh, <laughs> And you ne need to remember that. I got that message, yeah. And we need, no, seriously though, that's just wrong, especially this far downstream on the Murray. If you've got a, a barrier here that is effectively stopping the migration of fish upstream, it's having a huge impact.
on the rest of the river. So we really do need to do something about that. So of course, those early settlers utilised the fish. Uh, they were prolific in those days. They caught lots of them and they ate them. In fact, in some areas, there were so many of them, they fed them to their stock or used them, dug them into the fields and used them as fertiliser. That's how many fish there were. And we've all seen photos like these early ones of big catches of Murray cod. Interestingly, though, if you look at a lot of those photos, a lot of the fish are not huge. And that's always the way. I mean, in any population of fish, there's always going to be more sub-adult and, and smaller fish than there is the, the monstrous big ones. But of course they caught plenty of big ones as well. This one over on the right here, a commercially caught one at Corowa in 1924, 97 pounds. That's a pretty big cod in anyone's language. But you know, these guys here with the stringer of fish. Now, this is 1928, 1924. So we're already talking about nearly a hundred years ago. And by that stage, there was a heck of a lot of fish being extracted from the water. And I'll tell you now, none of these fish were caught on rod and reel. They were caught on set lines, cross lines, in drum nets, in gill nets. And they were caught purely to be utilised, to be eaten. A lot of them were sold locally. Some of them were shipped to Melbourne to be sold in the markets down there. So there was a huge extraction. You know, even as more recently, 1958, that's the Astoria Cafe in Echuca, and they're butchering up some locally caught cod to be served through the cafe. So there was a huge take of fish during that period, and a big commercial fishery. A lot of people don't realise that, but there were a lot of commercial fishermen operating throughout the, the inland rivers back in those days. And the numbers, even by the mid 1920s, there were a lot of people observing that the numbers of fish were crashing already. And it was getting very, very hard to catch, particularly decent sized uh, Murray cod. So I wouldn't want to go back a hundred years. I don't think you'd necessarily find better fishing. And we'd already done a lot of damage to the environment. So I think the decline started at least 100 years ago. So if you were going to see significantly better fishing, you'd probably have to go back about 150, 200, 250 years. So that's where I'd be setting the controls on my time machine. Then the gear started to change. From, from a selfish angler's point of view, things start to get interesting from about that same period because instead of just being a meat extracting exercise using set lines and cross lines and drum nets, suddenly a few people started to realise that Whilst they weren't trout and salmon, these were actually really exciting and interesting fish to catch and people actually started targeting them on lures. Again, originally for a feed, cord line out the back of a little rowboat with an aeroplane spinner on it, especially when the river was running a little bit clearer than normal and the fish were willing to hit a lure and it was a great way to catch fish. Again, they all ended up getting killed and eaten. You know, things kept evolving. Uh, we started importing lures from the US, bass lures and pike lures from Europe, and a few Australian lure makers started to make their own. Uh, that's an Australian lure at the top left there. People were starting to use more sophisticated tackle to actually target the fish instead of just a set line or a cross line or a drum net. They were holding a rod and reel in their hand and casting lures. At about the same time, there were media influences. People like Vic McChrystal and Brian Pratt and Rod Harrison started writing about inland native fish as a sport fishing target. So people were, were using bass style bait caster gear and these imported and locally made lures to cast for these fish and suddenly started recognising that we had a fantastic sport fishery on these inland species and celebrating that fact. Again though, they were still mostly getting kept and killed. There wasn't a heck of a lot of catch and release around at that stage. It's about then that I started to get involved in, in fishing myself and in writing for fishing magazines and so forth. I started off as a school teacher and that's me, believe it or not, in the foreground there. My first posting was to Burke up on the Darling River at the end of the 1970s. And I couldn't wait to get out there and have a crack at these yellow belly and Murray cod on bait caster gear like I've got there in my hand. I was really excited to go and see that kind of fishing and experience it myself. Unfortunately, I arrived about three or four years after the carp arrived in Burke. That was the real carp plague that pushed up through the Darling River through the 1970s. And by the time I got there, you could just about walk across the Darling at uh, North Burke Weir on the backs of the carp. They were, as often happens when the first wave of a, an exotic species comes through, they absolutely boomed. They just about displaced 
everything else. For the year or so that I lived there and fished a lot, I probably would have caught 50 to 100 carp for every native fish that I caught. I caught a few yellow belly, I caught a few silver perch, I caught a few small cod, but it was really disappointing fishing. The carp just dominated everything and for that reason I ended up doing a lot more hunting than fishing and fishing just became a carp extracting process. You just dragged them out of the water and threw them up the bank and killed them. I saw very, very few decent cod caught. The only large Murray cod that I saw while I lived in Burke were hanging up on a meat hook in the chillers at the local hotel and the locals up there when they talked about a Murray cod they never talked about it being bat long they always talked about it being bat long because that's when you hang them up that's how that's how big they are. So it was not a great time so I would definitely say that 40 50 years ago the fishing was nowhere near as good as it is today. Then things started to turn around. We started realising that we had to look after the habitat and the environment the fish lived in, but also we started restocking. Now, restocking is only ever going to be a band-aid solution. You shouldn't need to restock fish in a natural or even a semi-natural environment if they can spawn and reproduce and replace themselves. You shouldn't need to stock. But we developed hatcheries so that we could stock fish into man-made impoundments, and there were more and more of these dams being built. We know the negative effect of dams. You've got thermal pollution pollution downstream from the cold water, you've got the stoppages in the flows, you've got taking those highs and lows out of the annual flow regime that we know we need to sustain native fish. But you need dams too if you're going to live the kind of lifestyle that we all wanted to live. We need to irrigate, we needed electricity so we had dams. We stocked a lot of those dams with native fish and created some pretty amazing recreational fisheries that have continued to boom today and have really done wonders for the local economies in many, many areas throughout inland Australia. And this kick-started what I call the, the Murray Cod Renaissance, but it's a native fish renaissance in general, where we once again realised what a great sport fish we had there, and we started being able to catch quite a few more, particularly in these impoundments, and bigger and bigger fish. And then social media came along and we were able to share our catches of those fish with other people, and, and a whole appreciation of, of the Murray Cod and Golden Perch as as great iconic Australian sport fish really started to spread through the whole angling community and with it a whole catch and release ethos. I was in my 50s before I finally caught my first metre plus Murray Cod not too far from here down in Lock 8 back in 2016-2017 and I caught it out of a kayak and as you can see I was pretty stoked. Like a lot of other people, I've really got into the whole chasing cod on lures and specialist tackle, and we always let them go. Now, I'm, I shouldn't say that. Out of an impoundment, I will keep a 65 or 70 centimetre cod, maybe one or two a year, and eat them, because I do like eating them, like the ones we had tonight. Even though they were farmed, they were really nice. I don't see any problem in a put-and-take fishery in an impoundment with taking an occasional one out, but I probably prefer not to out of the rivers these days, but you're still allowed to, and where they're in reasonable numbers, there's nothing wrong with taking one in that slot size limit every now and again. It's not just the cod. Uh, golden perch have really boomed in, in the impoundments as well. They actually quite like the still water created by man-made dams and grow to enormous sizes that we never saw much of in the rivers. It's interesting to watch the fashions and trends back in the 90s and, and very early 2000s. Everyone was making the big trip north to go and fish the Barramundi dams in Queensland that have been stocked with barra and were producing all these metre plus barra. 2010, 2011, we had the big flood events and a lot of those barra went over the wall of the dam. They'll always try and run downstream so they can spawn in the salt water. They've just got that biological imperative built into them so they lost a lot of the barra. And that attention then switched to the Murray Cod in places like Copeton and Eildon in Victoria and Burrinjuk and Burrindong and a lot of the other dams that were producing a lot of these big Murray Cod and that became the place to go to catch a metre plus freshwater fish and cod took on that mantle that had previously been held by the Barramundi. But there's good news stories in parts of the rivers too, you know, that's a stretch of the Murrumbidgee between uh, Wagga and Narandra. Lots of great habitat in there. There's been some restocking. People are doing the right thing and not hauling fish out and killing them 
uh, anymore and it's starting to boom again as a fishery. A lot of small fish, trout cod, there's a lot of trout cod in that stretch. There's a reasonable number of golden perch, there's a few silver perch, a lot of carp still unfortunately, but it's all starting to bounce back. You can fix things so it's not, it's not all bad news and you can go out and target cod. You know, you might not catch monsters all the time but you can catch them. My wife Jo grew up in Darwin and only moved down south with me about 10 years or so ago and she's taken to Murray cod fishing like a duck to water. She absolutely loves it. And surface lure fishing for cod. No one thought about that 20 odd years ago. There were a few switched on anglers up in the New England area of northwestern New South Wales who were doing it. They were out there catching cod on surface lures, but they kept it pretty quiet. Now it's, it's swept through cod fishing and the thought of catching a metre plus cod off the surface is just amazing. And, and if you've done it and you've experienced it, you know it's one of the biggest blasts you can get. Entire families of lures have been developed uh, specifically specifically to target these big Murray cod, both imported and locally made ones, and, and the gear to use them. So it's been really good for the economy, it's been good for the tackle trade, it's good for tackle shops, it's good for the importers and the manufacturers of the gear. The message I want to get across tonight is that it's not all doom and gloom, we can fix things up. Organisations like Ozfish have got some of the answers and we know we can definitely make things better. I would argue that the fishing's actually not too bad at all in a lot of places these days. I just went onto social media a couple of days ago and just pulled a few shots that had been up on Facebook and Instagram across the last couple of weeks of people with these massive cod and there's, there's a lot more than this out there. These are just shots that have come up in the last few weeks of all fish well over a metre, some of them up into the 120s and 130s and there's lots and lots more on there if you want to look. And the big difference is between those photos and the, the old black and white photos I showed you from 100 years ago, every single one of these fish is being released. Now I'm not going to stand here and tell you that every single one of them is necessarily going to survive because some of the handling practices probably leave a little bit to be desired but 85 90 percent of those fish are still out there they're still out there for you and i to catch they're still out there for our kids and their kids to catch and if they get the chance to spawn in a riverine environment then they're going to produce tens of thousands of other cod for future generations to catch. So it's not all doom and gloom. Our inland fisheries face a hell of a lot of challenges, but as we've heard tonight, we're, each year we're understanding more and more about what those challenges are. We know what some of the answers are. We can make what's already a pretty good fishery even better if we all work towards it and look after it and put some pressure on the, on the people that make the decisions, tell them the fishway down here doesn't work and get it fixed. Fairly basic stuff like that and environmental flows, they need to be done at the right time and at the right level so that the fish can spawn and we're going to have more and more fish for the future. So let's celebrate the fact that compared to 50 years ago, these are the good old days and if we all work together, they can get even better and we can make sure that our kids and their kids enjoy an absolute golden age of inland fishing. Thank you.